Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the fourth uh, session of the uh, second BAF Summit, Global Summit. Um, uh, with this session, we have Roland van der Stappen. Of, uh, he's the Vice President of Policy and Engagement at um, Crypto.com. Welcome, Roland. Uh, and we also have with us uh, Tassos Aurelides um, of the Hellenic Blockchain Association of Greece. Um, so we're delighted to have you both uh, speaking to us today. Roland, perhaps you could start um, with your presentation. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak at today's event. And I would say only in crypto do you find the many enthusiasts to dial in on, on a Saturday. And for those people who are not familiar with Crypto.com, we're one of the leading global uh, crypto trading platforms, counting more than 50 million uh, customers worldwide. Uh, today, I would like to cover uh, three things. One, what does the current state of the crypto market mean for policymakers? Two, what do we see from the business side in terms of uh, regulatory approaches to crypto across jurisdictions? And three, how I can uh, industry and policymakers work together to de deliver a comprehensive regulatory framework for industry uh, moving forward. So let me start with the current state of the market. Um, as you all know and uh, see and read, uh, crypto markets have become more correlated to traditional markets. And it's clear that the current macroeconomic outlook is impacting the crypto market just like any other sector. But in addition, obviously, the failures and challenges faced by certain crypto players in recent months have added to the crypto market uh, downturn. And it has been the design and often, I would say, ultra leveraged business models of these specific projects that have unfortunately um, resulted in losses for retail investors. But however, also many projects have demonstrated continued resilience and, and sound risk management. So it's important to avoid a generalization, for example, that all stable coins or DeFi protocols um, have, have failed. But regulation and policymaker intervention is needed to address shortcomings in, in business models and also more generally promote safe crypto markets, both on the retail and the uh, institutional end. And obviously, in this uh, current environment, we see headlines and sound bites from regulators focused on the market downturn, volatility and uh, risk for retail investors. But uh, we still have strongly believe that the importance, utility of crypto technologies uh, remains as strong as ever and continues to uh, prove uh, their value. So in the next market cycle, um, we believe that we will move beyond sp uh, speculation and we'll see the emergence um, of new use cases that clearly demonstrate the social utility um, of crypto. I think that's also why we see increased interest from institutional investors to gain exposure to uh, to our industry, which is also shows um, uh, maturization um, of crypto as, a, as an asset class. So above all, you know, we remain optimistic uh, about the future and the role we as Crypto.com can play to make sure that the crypto technology reaches its full potential and uh, we also uh, believe that regulation will be key uh, for our long-term success of our industry. So on that note, let me move to um, the different regulatory approaches that we have seen across uh, jurisdictions. And for starters, I would say that crypto asset markets are global uh, in nature. So uh, as a business that uh, operates globally, we support international alignment and consistency as much as uh, as possible and also say that minimum uh, regulatory standards globally are needed to avoid arbitrage and uh, in particular on the anti money laundering side but we are still far off from such a global comprehensive framework because different jurisdictions are at different stages in the development of their own um, crypto framework and it's unlikely to have to have a global uh, common framework if, for example, major jurisdictions as the United States or the UK have not uh, yet, yet put in place their, their own regime. And as this is a global market, uh, 
players and it's our to be a global brand that operates locally straight to obtain creation and licenses in each market in which we operate and we have uh, recently had quite some positive momentum there as we got regulatory approval in uh, uk dubai south korea canada and also in principle approval in in singapore kind of from our perspective showing that we, we are building a business um with from uh, with compliance as a key key building block and operating across different markets we kind of believe that the building blocks for a regulatory framework should be uh, the same no matter uh, in which country you operate and i think there are three key building blocks uh, for us um, the first one is know your customer and anti-money laundering policies which have been the first uh, focus um area focus for uh, regulators worldwide because without those crypto technology cannot successfully be the foundation for a new and modern uh, financial system um, and that's also why we support global and consistent implementation of the FATF travel rule which essentially requires trading platforms like ourselves to share relevant information on sender and recipients for transactions with, uh, with other uh, platforms but what we have seen is that um, certain jurisdictions have gone beyond the FATF uh, travel rule, essentially gold plating it by, for example, removing the thousand euro threshold for reporting, which is there for cash transactions or ordinary credit transfers, or extending it to transactions between a trading platform and a self hosted wallet, and a self hosted wallet being essentially an interface uh, that provides access to. Um, an address on the on the blockchain and that often comes from a still a misperception or misunderstanding that transactions between trading platforms uh, and self host wallets or between self host wallets themselves are not traceable because uh, the verification of the owner of a self host wallet is technically impossible um, all transactions on the uh, blockchain are open and transparent by, by nature, so the use of blockchain analytics and the use of regulated on and off ramps will reduce rather than increase illicit activity compared to traditional um, banking systems. So, and I think that's a point that regulators are increasingly um, getting uh, familiar with and, uh, and, and appreciating. And I think, so the first building block for us is KYC and AML. The second one is stablecoin regulation, which we see is now the, the new priority for regulators across the globe, because stablecoins are the bridge between crypto and fiat currency. And obviously, the terror collapse has has made clear that not all stablecoins are stable, uh, nor the same. So looking at stablecoin regulation across the globe, we see there's a common requirement um, for for them to have a legal entity in each market in which they operate to have effective supervision. We believe there will be differences in the composition of reserve requirements for, for issuers of those stable coins, but um, they, they will and should be strict and most importantly, transparent uh, and, and audible. Uh, what I have also found interesting is, for example, that the Bank of England is now looking into a backstop, a backstop for systemic uh, stable coins, which will further increase consumer protection and trust in the uptake of uh, this, this in innovation. But where maybe more importantly, we see some maybe philosophical differences, you could call them, between jurisdictions is on the role and prospect of stable coins as a means of retail payments. And for it's our own view that there should not be limits uh, uh, if stable coins are uh, well well regulated. And regulation of stable coins is, however, key, and we also appreciate this is being prioritized so that stable coins can be used across a wide range of use cases, ranging from digital remittances, corporate treasury services, and a safe collateral uh, in DeFi protocols. Third, but not least, um, we believe that regulation of players like ourselves 
the so-called CASPs, is key to set a high standard in terms of consumer protection, security, resilience, and market in integrity. And here we believe that MICA, so the European uh, regulatory framework for crypto assets, uh, will act as a global reference point uh, and uh, will likely inform the work from uh, IOSCO, which will set the minimum standards um, globally. Um, so finally, looking at how can industry and regulators uh, work uh, together moving forward, I think we should uh, kind of underscore that it's important to maintain and start from a positive vision that recognizes the benefits and potential that crypto technology can bring, both to modernizing the foundation of the financial system, but also um, unlocking Web 3.0, because, because crypto technologies um, have application far beyond uh, financial services, even though uh, the, uh, the focus uh, is often uh, on its impact on the financial sector. Um, we should make sure that we create an enabling environment for uh, innovation, um, allow innovation to flourish by putting in place uh, uh, the appropriate uh, safeguards. So in that context, ideas like and proposals like the DLT sandbox or a pilot regime in Europe and the UK for financial market infrastructure to use DLT is welcome. And it's kind of these kind of platforms allow industry and regulators to learn from each other and adopt regulatory frameworks uh, in time accordingly. In particular, I would say reporting and transparency obligations where they need to be adapted to a DLT um, environment. It's often said that new regulation should be constructed on the principle of same risk and same regulatory outcome, which is different from same risk, same rules, because it's important to acknowledge that uh, crypto technologies um, are, are will um, reimagine the the foundation of the financial system, as they, for example, allow for twenty four seven trading, instant um, clearing, and uh, and settlements. Uh, ha having a system with less intermediaries, so uh, it's important that um, the regulatory framework kind of. Um, acknowledges that the same for that the fact that all transactions are transparent, open, publicly available on the blockchain. So that's something that ML will should consider. And as this is a rapidly evolving uh, industry and each year brings new use cases and innovations, um, continued dialogue between industry and regulators is key and forums like the crypto sprints that the FCA organized are key as a, as a mean to make sure that policy is proportionate and effective. Uh, and I think this is going to be definitely the case uh, for, for DeFi and kind of welcome the approach that regulators are taking there around the world to first kind of uh, focus on exploring, understanding what DeFi is, have a common taxonomy, which is something we like to see across crypto in, in general before you put in place your, your legal framework. Uh, to kind of round up, uh, I would say that our view that appropriate regulation of our industry is key to support innovation and improvements in both finance and the Web3 economy. And it will be the companies that build responsibly, resiliently, and work with regulators that will succeed um, in the long term. So I would say thank you for listening and um, for the BBA for uh, organizing this time event. Great. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, Ronald. Thanks, Lauren. Just uh, one very quick uh, question. Um, so we are working with regulators and policymakers from around the globe, regularly meet with them. So if they want to get in touch with the, with you or crypto.com to, 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 to discuss um, uh, various things, licensing and others, where crypto.com is not licensed, uh, what would be the best uh, way to, to get hold of you? Or what's the point of contact? Um, I'm happy to share, um, or you can share my contact details uh, with those people. And it probably would be uh, my compliance colleagues or legal colleagues that would be uh, most appropriate to engage on licensing issues. 
But as I said from the beginning, um, wherever there is a, a license or registration opportunity in the world, we seem we we want to be there as as soon as uh, as we can. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And now we have uh, Tassos Aurelides of the Hellenic Blockchain Association of Greece. Uh, Tassos, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, guys. Uh, Great. How are you? First of all, I, I would like to mention, uh, I would like to offer my congratulations of Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, and uh, I would like also to say that there is nothing else to mention regarding policies after Ronald. And of course, uh, I'd li I, I liked very much Stephen's uh, uh, speech uh, from New Zealand. So uh, regarding uh, me now, I would like to focus more on uh, the one aspect that uh, other people mentioned, Mika, which is currently handcuffing most of the projects within the EU because Greece is part of the European Union and the Eurozone in general. So. Uh, I would like just to mention that we do expect some, some you know, more advanced and faster space on uh, implementing and bringing some uh, practical and thorough military context. Because uh, what I understand from uh, this uh, conference is that really uh, we only see some big as of what is coming. There is not, nothing practical deal. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to, to say that uh, undoubtedly there has been some setbacks back in 2021 and this year also. Uh, okay, of course, the main reason is the over-leveraged economy and the blockchain. We do all know that. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, just out of sudden, didn't came out of the sudden. Uh, we were all expecting that this bubble will, be, will burst at some point, as we do expect in the normal economy, because one part of the of today's topic is the future of global economy. Don't get there in a moment. But what I would like to say is that we are, we were really not uh, prepared for the collapse of stable coins, and I don't know if the best approach for regulators is to start by regulating stable coins when practically the main essence is they do not work in the technology. Now they are rushing into um, regulating Web3, which to some extent is uh, one of the questions, what didn't go well? So practically I would say that it didn't go well with regulating Google, Facebook, then Meta, Amazon and so on. So they are, when you don't learn from your own mistakes in the past, you didn't learn the, the lesson. So if we don't have a well precedent on regulating Web two, uh, let's say technology, what's what's the precedent to go and claim that successfully you're going to regulate Web three? So that's one of my main concerns, and I think that uh, this before we did. Uh, much better and uh, with uh, more thorough arguments. Uh, furthermore, uh, national policies regarding Greece, I would say that we're following Mika as uh, every other European country, so I wouldn't say that there has been some, some innovative uh, progress or fast in any extent. Uh, but I would like to say that I do see some positive uh, steps from the Ministerial Transformation, uh, the new government of the last couple of years is trying to digitalize and transform the collector and of course they're more boost uh let's say domestic economy but as we all know the supply chain globally has been disrupted after COVID-19 so I, I think that, uh, there are some As I mentioned over the last uh, uh, conference that we had, uh, nevertheless, uh, I would like just to, to make a better focus on the future of global economy, where it seems pretty pessimistic, at least for me. And um, I would like just to say that I don't see some bright, uh, some bright spots in the, in the near future, uh, due to the fact that uh, war is... Uh, you know, everywhere around us. And uh, I'm really, 
pessimistic about the future of the global economy, actually, because that's really something that uh, no one touched in a great extent today. And I would like just to say that uh, we do need to see how blockchain can accelerate the U-turn of uh, the recession that is coming and looming over everyone's economy right here. And uh, I don't see how regulators actually can fix this, especially when they try to overregulate the technology itself, which practically cannot be regulated. How you can regulate in a certain extent on one country uh, this technology and on another country is completely deregulated. I mean, blockchain doesn't uh, know borders. So I'm not sure how this anthropocentric technology can be regulated, uh, not in balance, let's say, uh, in accordance and synchronization between countries. Uh, in conclusion, and I would like to save your time, gentlemen. Uh, I would like to say that uh, blockchain really has the capacity in a great extent to accelerate economical boost and growth uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, ESG is now uh, the basic context about the uh, financial sector and it's going to be for the next decade or so and uh, in Greece and especially also in uh, Xenius Group and Hellenic Blockchain Association is trying to build uh, blockchain ESG solutions for uh, large businesses and of course small and medium enterprises which can further help them understand the benefits of blockchain on the one hand and on the other hand to try and uh, be as regulated and as possible aligned with the best and most updated standards of the modern economy. Uh, that's for me to say and, uh, thank you very much uh, for organizing uh, this event once again. Thank you very much, Tassos. Um, yeah, fa fascinating approach on, on, on the global economy and how, uh, how it's impacting crypto and vice versa. So um, that's great. Uh, that is the end of this session. And uh, we will be rejoining fairly shortly. Uh, I think it's yeah. at, uh, yes, around... 11.45, yeah. 11.45, yeah. So In about 10 minutes' time, we will have Spain and India. So see you yeah. there. Looking forward to that. Thanks. Bye-bye.